So internally, the program adds 10 mass points between the nodes, dividing it into lengths of 1.364 meters or 4.475 feet, which is half of that calculated length. And the natural frequency results now match much closer to what we predicted using Rourke's equation. Here, if we manually add in the node points at the half calculated span, just to view the trace, you will notice as the frequency increases, more points are tied to their original positions. This means that the higher order modes are less likely to vibrate because they're tied more closely. Conversely, the lower order modes are more likely to predominate in the total system response. The measure of the mode's tendency to vibrate is the mode participation factor, and the degree by which the mode is excited is further influenced by the applied load distribution and the mode shape, and the mass participation factor indicates the individual modal mass that acts in a particular direction. The importance of the mass spacing is primarily to find all the natural frequencies that exist below the desired cutoff that will excite our piping system. This way, when we apply the load distribution and combine the individual modal responses into the total system response, we will accurately account for the vibrating mass. So what should the cutoff frequency be? The idea is to try and get all the mass acting, and this is documented in the frequency report with the mode participation factors. You can see here the influence of the lower order modes, except the axial one, which would not normally be so influential. The more of the total system mass that is accounted for, the better. And certainly we would want to achieve at least 75 to 80% where possible. And we see that we are doing so here as we're achieving about 89%. Due to the complexity of some piping systems, there might be a large number of degrees of freedom and therefore insignificant modes that would require a long solution time. And it's not always practical to capture 75 to 80%. So we do have missing mass correction techniques available. Along with the frequency report, we also have a frequency tab of, on the result grid, which is similar, and that is what is being shown here. This is what we will be using most often in the workbook examples going forward in the dynamic analysis training classes. So to help with the problem of model refinement versus mass participation, we have two static correction methods, zero period acceleration and missing mass correction. In cases where the dynamic load is applied very near a support or directly at the support, the support reaction might be near zero or significantly less than the actual reaction. The reason could be because the mode shapes involving the movement between the applied load direction and the support point are not computed as specified by the number of modes or the cutoff frequency. These missing mode shapes are usually axial, very stiff modes, and hence they're associated with mode shapes in the very high frequency range. We can see that in the cantilever model in the frequency report, the axial mode in the x direction is at 84 hertz and has 80% of the mass acting. So this would be very significant. But if our cutoff frequency was lower, it would not have found this node. This is in the rigid range, so a static approximation can be applied to capture this. So what happens with static correction is an additional static earthquake analysis is performed and the maximum reaction from both static and dynamic analyses is used. The ZPA option envelopes dynamic results with equivalent static results. First, the structure is subjected to the peak ground acceleration and the entire mass of the structure is considered. The static response is obtained for the structure and the larger of the static and dynamic response is used. The second option is missing mass correction. First, the amount of mass captured by all of the extracted modes is subtracted from the total mass. The structure is subjected to acceleration equal to the cutoff frequency and only the uncaptured mass is considered. The static response is obtained for the structure and the static response is combined with the dynamic response using the user specified combination method. And actually this static response is the algebraic sum of all the missing modes and represents the in-phase response as you would expect from the rigid modes. ZPA is available for all types of dynamic analysis 
and missing mass correction is available for harmonic, response spectrum, and four spectrum only. This is because for time history analysis, a separate static analysis would have to be performed at every time step, uh, and this is a bit unrealistic. In Autopipe, we have reviewed our mode shapes interactively on the screen, but we also want to review our frequency report or frequency grid to review our captured modal mass for our modal analysis. We will be using the result grid often throughout the dynamic analysis training class. So from the result ribbon, under the interactive grouping, I'll open the result grid and I'll select the frequency tab. This is a review of what we saw in the presentation. We see that we are capturing a total average modal mass of 89.06%. And that is above the general recommendation of 75 to 80%. Keep in mind that that general recommendation will definitely have exceptions. And it's very important to be aware of the requirements of each individual model and the type of analysis you're performing on that model. So we'll talk in more detail about this general requirement as we go through the different examples of dynamic analyses. In order to capture the other 11% of modal mass for this model to get a full 100% analysis, we can use our static correction methods. So the last page in the workbook does uh, show a review of the different static correction methods available. We have missing mass correction. So to include all the system mass in the dynamic analysis, it has to have all been assigned to modes determined by the modal analysis. And if a significant amount of mass is missing, then a correction needs to be made. So by including missing mass in the analysis, this is the procedure that's followed. The amount of mass captured by all extracted modes is subtracted from the total mass. The uncaptured mass is subjected to an acceleration equal to that at the cutoff frequency. And the uncaptured mass is considered as another mode and then combined with the other modes using the specified combination method selected. Or you can use zero period acceleration to capture that other 11%. It was noticed in the modal analysis of the cantilever model that high frequency axial modes can exist and these can be significant. And if these aren't determined by the modal analysis before the cutoff frequency, then a potential underestimation of support loads can occur, particularly where the dynamic loading is axial in nature, like if we're talking about fluid pulsations. The inclusion of ZPA can correct for these missing modes, and it follows the following procedure. The entire structure mass is subjected to the peak ground acceleration. The static response is obtained for the structure as well, and the larger of these static and dynamic responses is reported. So that's truly enveloping the results. These are your two options for static correction methods for most of your dynamic analyses, but again, we will talk in further detail on these options as we go through each individual class. This concludes the modal analysis workbook. Thank you for joining into the modal analysis and dynamic introduction at Autopipe Advanced Training class. This is a great class to set you up to learn further about all of our dynamic analysis options. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.